So guys, uh, now Rotem Elder uh, is with us from Crazy Labs, and he will tell us uh, the publishing checklist for launching uh, number one mobile game. So, Rotem, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, guys, thanks for being here. Let me just share my screen. Um, today we'll talk about uh, the publishing checklist for launching a number one mobile game. Um, not, I know it's not, uh, you know, it's not going to guarantee you uh, to have a one, a, ch a top chart list game if you follow these guidelines, but it does increase the hit ratio, as we call it, by uh, a really significant amount. Let me start sharing screen. I'm guessing you can all see it now. So I'm going to start uh, with two great gifts. On the left, you see one of the games that uh, shaped my childhood, and I'm guessing that uh, it shaped yours as well. It's called Doom. And on the right side hand, uh, you can see a Click Nails game, which I'm guessing you played uh, for around 15 minutes when you just wanted to see what's missing in your game. Um, so I understand and uh, I feel the same way that I'm saying that I'd much rather create the next Doom or the next StarCraft for the example, but uh, we publish whatever works and that's how we work in, in Crazy Labs and in the entire hyper-casual industry. Uh, working on hyper-casual games might not fulfill your indie game fantasy, but it's important to say that it's a business and that's how we should approach it. This connects me, of course, to what I'm going to speak about today, uh, the publishing checklist for launching number one mobile game. A little bit about me. My name is Rotem. I'm a publishing manager here in Crazy Labs. I'm working in the industry uh, for around eight years, the gaming industry, and uh, I'm a PC gamer myself. I never had any connection to the hyper-casual industry, but you know the thrill of uh, getting a game out and releasing a game that has then get more than, I don't know, 1 million downloads a day. Uh, it really makes the job super fun. Uh, eventually, I would want to working be working on a game that's more of, um, you know, a big game like StarCraft, like Doom, like the games I'm playing myself. But hyper casual, that's, that's how we should uh, address it maybe, that we're not the consumers, we're not the people who eventually are playing the game. We're launching the game and targeting the entire world. So we'll talk about uh, a bit about Crazy Labs, uh, the ecosystem of hypercasual, and we'll deep dive into pro five tips of uh, how to create your hypercasual games. I'll tell you about some of the latest games uh, that we've had, and we'll also have time for questions. So feel free to type your questions in the chat. Crazy Labs is a top three publisher uh, with over 3.5 down, billion downloads uh, for our games and over 100 million unique monthly active users. Uh, we have offices in Tel Aviv, Skopje, Shanghai, Luyan, Kiev. So if you're also searching for your next job, you might find it here with us. Apart from publishing games, we're also a studio. The we have a casual games lab, creating games like Jumanji and Stupid Silas. Uh, we have the hyper casual lab that creates and publishing games like Ran Sausage Run, Tie Dye, SMR Slicing, and more. Um, and we have another top secret lab that uh, I hope we can reveal it in the near future. So stay tuned. As always, uh, we have best case scenario and worst case scenario for everything, right? So let's start with looking at the best case scenario. If you find an idea that you like and uh, you thought of a cool video for a CTR test, um, you're going to work around one or two weeks to create it. Uh, great. So think about uh, the best case scenario, of course, which you will have a great CTR. Great CTR meaning that the users liked it, meaning they wanted to click on the ad. It doesn't matter if the game is there or not. We can direct the users to somewhere else, but it does give you a benchmark that you're going to say, okay, uh, this game has a great CTR, now let's start to produce a game. So we'll move to a CPI test and we'll produce a build to the store, just a couple levels to pass Apple and Google's review. 
Uh, if that goes well, we'll actually develop a game for retention with enough meta game for users to play around one or two days. Uh, so within just a few weeks, you know if you're in the right direction or not. Uh, some of the publishers will also pay you uh, for your tests to cover up some of your team's ex expenses, uh, like we do. So it minimizes the risks of developing and allow your team to be creative. The worst case scenario, so let's say you worked on a video for around two weeks and it passed and you wanted to check the CPI and failed somewhere along the way. All right, so you wasted two or three weeks tops in order to know that you're moving in the wrong direction, which is great. You can kill this idea, kill the game, and move on to the next project. Remember, it's very hard to nail a great CTR. We also fail a lot, but we allow our developers to do that by covering their uh, expenses and also supporting them and working with them in order to learn what they did wrong and how we can improve uh, from there on. So in eight weeks, we can test four or even six prototypes or six videos. So with also the right publisher, you will cover up some of your expenses and eventually, you know, it's a big numbers rule. Eventually, as you test more, you will eventually hit the, the game that you want, the good CTR, the good CPI, the good retention, and publish a game. So let's talk about five tips that can give uh, that we can give and I can give in order to make a game a hit. It doesn't mean that if you follow these five tips, it guarantees a top chart hit, but it will increase uh, your chances significantly. This is my personal checklist whenever I get a new game to check. So number one, it's uh, all about the trend, of course, but it's not only about the trend, it's about seeing how big it is and what people love about it. So once you find a trend, think about how to, first, of course, the amount of people that watch these videos. So if we take an example, we have here on the right ASMR slicing, which started from a kinetic send video. And just by typing kinetic send or tie dye or soap cutting, uh, in YouTube, you'll find videos with tens of millions of views for each of these ideas. Um, so if you create a game based on the trend, on the big trend, it almost guarantees you a low CPI. And again, you don't have to build the game, um, build a game based on trend, of course, but if you do think how big it is, Number two is gamification. You need to learn exactly what the steps are in the game that you're planning to do. So I took here, for example, tie-dye, which is a great example. I mean, tie-dye was a huge thing in the 80s, and for some reason it came back. People are now wearing tie-dye clothes. You have Jennifer Lopez, you have all sorts of famous people that are every day wor working in these clothes, which is okay, you know, fads are coming back and, and we throw out history. And it's cool. The main thing to do and the main thing to know as game developers, we thought about how to gamify this, how to make this a game. And also, we wanted to be uh, exactly doing the same thing as these videos are doing or showing, because if we show something different to the users, eventually they will not play it. So I mentioned a lot of the upside about creating a game that's based on a trend that you will have most likely you will have a good CPI if you uh, execute it correctly. But the downside is if you don't execute it perfectly, you will have bad retention because people are kind of expecting what to do. If you're creating a runner or a shooter game, then it's great. You have your own interpretation and own uh, thing that you're creating. So people, you know, they don't really know what to expect because there's millions of games of runner and shooter games. But if when you're creating a game that is based on a trend, they already know what to do. So when I click, if I'm uh, a tie-dye lover and I do it in my backyard, so I click on the ad, I know what I'm going to do. And if you show me different steps or different things that uh, are different than what I'm doing myself or watching the videos, then I won't play this game. And 
we also need to think about the mechanics. So it's sort of a simulation game here, uh, tie-dye. And we also need to think about the mechanics and the controls to make it fun, make it original, and use different controls in each step of the way. Number three is the video. So I'm always saying it in all of my presentations, and I'm going to say it now again. People need to know what to do from the first three seconds of watching the video and also playing the game. So it's very important that people understand what they need to do. And if you're showing them a cool video, doesn't matter how cool it is, the colors, the action, the bombing, whatever it is, they need to know what they're going to do or else it just, they wouldn't relate to it. Um, also, we need to show in the videos the wow moment of the game. I'm not looking for things that are not in the game. I'm looking for things that are only in the game, but it shows us the, the wow factor or the wow moment of the game. In tie-dye is where the shirt comes out and it comes out beautifully. In I Can Paint, for example, is how the, the picture is uh, shown in the end. Uh, win moment, fail moment, something that uh, will show the users, okay, this is why I want to play this game. Number four, and it's very important, uh, it's one of my, I think, the top one, in my opinion, is the data. The data doesn't lie. We think, okay, we have this coolest idea and it's going to rock the charts. And uh, I've seen it a lot of times from myself, from my team, from the developers that I work with, they're saying, okay, this is the best idea ever. We have to nail it. So we test it uh, and we don't um, jump over our heads, of course. We don't start with the CPI or the retention or the output test. We start with a simple video to test CTL. And if that doesn't work, we'll think about if we want to iterate it or stop wasting time, kill it, and move to the next um, idea. So once we detect, of course, the flow and everything, we test the video and we're looking for results. If the results aren't there, then eventually it doesn't matter how strongly we feel about this game, we'll have to teach it and kill it and move to the next one. I wouldn't use user acquisition hacks or user acquisition tricks, as we call it, um, with regarding of showing real-time footage or showing some fake end cards, things like that. I wouldn't use in the beginning because I want to check the market pulse. I want to check that the users relate to the video and they want to play the game and not click it because it has a funny fail moment from, I don't know, a real person falling uh, on its head or anything like that, or a cute dog. I mean, we do use it when we scale. Of course, everyone uses it. So we want to scale. We, the game has already, I don't know, 5 million, 10 million, 100 million downloads. Of course, we'll use user acquisition tricks. But when we want to start and we want to check if the users want to play this game before it's live, we have to use only the game play videos. Number five uh, brings me back to the first slide with Doom and Acrylic Nails. It's a business. It's not a fantasy to create the next iconic game. We're not creating the next Candy Crush and we're not creating the next Angry Birds. And that's fine with us. But we need to know that it's a business. Hyper casual games are free to play. They can be played by anyone, anywhere. They're short, they're satisfying. They have this mass appeal, right? It's not only for male, not only for females, not only for kids or adults. Everyone can play these games while you're watching football on TV, while you're waiting in line, while you're talking to your mother on the phone. It's all fine and that's how it's supposed to be. By playing for three minutes, you have a beginning, a core and an end to the game, to the session. Uh, I won't be able to do it when I'm playing Doom or any other shooter game or a strategy game. Three minutes just gets me to set up my, my space or my game. Uh, it won't give me any satisfaction. And that's what is appealing in this hyper casual industry. And let's look at it from a different angle and explain why it's a business and not a fantasy. So $5 million revenue. We took an uh, example of four different games that we published and we, sh we checked how long it took them to reach $5 million in revenue. So from the shortest one, which is ASMR slicing, took seven weeks to the longest one, 
that took only 12 weeks to produce $5 million in revenue, which is soap cutting. We showed the difference between the hyper casual industry and other games industry. Um, I also want to emphasize that games like soap cutting and ASML slicing were built by three people. That's it. Tie dye was exception, uh, five people, and the maze was built by two people. That's it. You need uh, a good game designer, a good developer, and a good 3D artist. You can have them three in one. You can have them in two people. It doesn't matter as long as you have these three, um, let's say, professions in your team. Now, it wouldn't happen in any other game. That's why we love hyper casual games that much. And especially in this time uh, with the uncertainty with coronavirus and you know anything regarding our future, we don't have time to work one year or a year and a half to create the next indie game or the next casual game or whatever game that you guys are creating. We are taking two, three weeks to come up with a couple of ideas for each of our developers, and that's how eventually they get to release a major hit that gives them $5 million in revenue in less than 12 weeks. It's all about the core, of course. So we said a lot about the gaming, a lot about the video, a lot about the mass appeal, uh, how much money it makes, but eventually the game is all about the core. If the game is interesting, then people will play it. If the game is not interesting, people won't play it. And that's a very simple equation. So it has to be satisfying. These hyper casual games are easy to learn, easy to master, and they're very satisfying. So we took an, uh, an example of I Can Paint, which wasn't our biggest games, but it's very satisfying. And you can see that even um, in the first test, which was a CPI test, a CPI test, sorry, we didn't care about people returning to the game. We had one level and one level at all, and that's it. And we didn't try to hide it. We didn't try to, to show, oh, it's a good game or, oh, it has many levels, but you keep repeating the same one. No, it had one level. And only with one level, 37% of the people came back the next day. Um, some games release, uh, some developers, some publishers release a game with 37% uh, day one retention. We also uh, published two games with that uh, amount of retention, but of course we wanted to see how the game looks like when it has a meta game. And so we added content, we added meta game, we tested it again, and we got to 60% day one retention, which made us, of course, release the game. So if it all doesn't seem uh, real to you or just too good to be true, I'd like to share the success story of our latest game, which is Acrylic Nails. We'll see how in this crazy coronavirus time, as I told you, our team Firescore from India managed to maintain heavy live ops for soap cutting, which is also their game from uh, later, earlier on this year, and create an amazing simulation game. So they started working on hyper casual a bit more than a year ago. They created three tests with us. The third one was uh, soap cutting, and from there they moved on to create a lot of other games that some failed and some succeeded. Um, and also if you played these two games, and I hope you did, you can see the improvement from soap cutting, which is very fun, this very ASMR game relates on a trend and it's very fun, but it doesn't have a lot of core to the involvement and what they did when creating acrylic nails, which is, I think it's one of our best games because it has Apart from being satisfying, you can you have a lot of options and a lot of ideas that you can execute with uh, building nails, of course, and um, and it always comes off nicely. So I'm not a huge nail fan, of course. I'd rather I'd rather much be playing uh, football games, but when I play acrylic nails and I played it a lot, I could understand what makes it so attractive to users. So it actually started with uh, our pitch, which is the favorite TikTok trend of our head of publishing. I use TikTok a lot now and we all use it in the team. And besides it making me feel very old every time I play it and use it, uh, it's a great source of ideation. So if you don't use any social media to get your ideas from, 
now is the time. And I think that if you take one thing out of this presentation is start going on social media, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, whatever you use, Snapchat, to get ideas for your games. Of course, it wasn't easy. The challenge was to gamify this trend, right? And we had a big challenge because we need to know what makes these acrylic nails videos so viral. Um, I'm showing, uh, there's an ad, of course. So I'm showing two videos. Uh, one is from the game and one is from YouTube. And we exactly copied everything that is being done in real life to the game including the stickers, the stencils, the, the filing, every part of building an acrylic nails is in our game. So it's one thing uh, to find a good trend to lean on, and you also need to think whether uh, it's a simulation game, an narrative game, whatever you guys are going to do, but you need the execution to be good. So leaning on, on trend is a huge risk. As I said before, um, if the game doesn't match the trend and it's not really showing what the real life experience is, the game will just not work. So the timeline of acrylic nails was different than others, uh, especially because the city out test was really high and exceptionally good. Uh, it was over 10% in city out. So we worked, actually worked 24 seven on this game. We created the best flow possible. We had uh, the fire score team working on it a lot. The, sorry, the internal team working on it a lot and everyone just put the, their heads together to create the best game and the best experience possible for the users. We skipped the CPI test and went straight to launch. Um, we weren't wrong with our hunch and I know we said we always use data and we do always use data, almost always, but we are also able to be um, agile with our, uh, with our process. And we, when we detect something that is exceptionally good, we will know how to work as fast as possible with skipping some stages if, they need, if we need to, making sure there are no clones and making sure that we're alone in the top charts, uh, except from Among Us, of course. And uh, we weren't wrong. I mean, the CPI was 5 cents when we launched. The day one retention was 37%. So as I said in the I Can Paint uh, slide, that we don't usually release games with uh, that low of uh, day one retention, but the CPI really covers for it, right? So we see it's a trade-off. If you have a very high CPI and a very high retention, it's good. It's like a puzzle game, like a maze, like other games that we launched. And if you have a very low CPI, you can work with a lower day one retention to make sure you are profitable. Um, so we knew the game wasn't perfect when we launched it and as showed with the day one retention of 37%. So we started a heavy live ops work on the game. We created skins, we created nice colors for Halloween, a lot of new features like you can see on the right hand side uh, with finishing the nail. So we had the first the stencils, then we added accessories and now we added the marble, which is a, uh, a real life technique that people use on uh, on customers, on clinics, whatever they do. Uh, and we saw it on TikTok and it was really cool. We added it and just by adding this feature, we increased uh, the output in a significant amount. So the idea here that we created and we followed it very carefully wherever we updated the game is first to give the player choices they can do whatever they want. They have three options to finishing the nail. They have uh, to pick the, the nail color, the nail shape. They can use some skins to do it. And of course, one thing that is always important to do, that the outcome will look nice. I mean, I have no idea about nails and I have no idea about how to create a nice looking nails. I'm very clumsy with colors as well. But when I play this game and when I play other simulation games like tie-dye, like I can paint, the end result is always beautiful. So that's what we did in order to keep the users afloat, keep the users uh, coming back to the game. We allow them to express their creativity and discover new things all the time. 
that keeps them engaged for a longer time. And it's almost three months since the launch and we're still on the top 20 with this game. So, you know, it's, it's a huge success for us. By the way, if you feel like you have a great team, but you're not sure on how to start, or if you have an amazing idea and you just don't know how to gamify it, you can try joining one of our hubs. We have one in India, one in Israel, and we will soon open a few more, so keep following. Uh, in our hubs, we're training the teams, we're injecting all of the hyper-casual knowledge into them, and they're ongoing, like a hyper-casual bootcamp. So, if you didn't find a relevant hub, you can always get in touch with me or one of our other publishing managers uh, for mentoring and coaching. They will do uh, whatever they can to help you publish your first game. You're also now uh, able to use our Click dashboard. It's a self-serve tool that will allow you to uh, test all your, your games in a self-served way. You will be able to transparently see the CTL, the CPC, the CPI, the day one retention, anything you want uh, according to each video that you uploaded. It's a very easy way to learn and to follow your mistakes and successes. So to sum it up, um, if you ask me what is the most important thing I take from this talk is to stop being afraid of failing, being afraid of taking your first step in the hyper-casual industry. Start small, build a small team. You don't have to have more than two or three people in the team. Just remember it has to be a good developer, good 3D artist, and a game designer. Um, so hook up with some friends from the industry or whoever people you can and let the exploration begin. Once you start developing hyper-casual games, you might just find yourself having the best winter you ever had. So um, yeah, instead of uh, you know creating your fantasy game, your indie game, taking six months to create it, utilize your time by doing fast iterations of videos. And again, you will fail a lot and that's fine. You can fail with five, six, 10 videos that you create, but eventually the one you succeed with is going to make you a lot of money. So I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, stay safe, of course, and Crazy Labs is still accepting pitches, games, videos, whatever you want to send us uh, to test, we'll be happy to test it. So you can count, contact me or any other publishing manager. And I hope that next time uh, I talk at Games Gathering, we'll be doing it in person. So let me just stop sharing my screen. Here we go. Well, Robin, thank you very much. And we have question now. Did you test in hypothesis of the new hyper casual games and how? So, yeah, we're testing uh, games on a video basis, as I said. So we don't even require a build on the store. We just test the video. We create a video, 30 seconds video of a gameplay. That's it. We send the user somewhere else, it doesn't even matter, but we're checking the CTR and the CPC of these videos. Uh, if you're asking about trends, then yes, we're testing a lot of trends. We watch a lot of TikTok and, um, you know, that's, that's what's strong right now. That's what's hot right now. And if you find a good trend, a good thing that, that you feel and you know that a lot of people are watching, then try to gamify, think about, what would be a cool game? You can consult with us. You can consult with your publisher and they will, of course, help you. 